Money FM 89.3, best of weekends. We have the CEO on with us right now, Tamor Nabili, to tell us more about how they are working together to give solutions and ideas to local countries in the region that are looking for that. Tamor, welcome. Glad to have you on the show. Good morning, Glenn. How are you? Uh, doing quite well, thanks. Tamar, frame for us what the need is around uh, not only Southeast Asia, but the, the broader Asia uh, region for solutions, for technology, for products, for the very kinds of things that you're looking to do. How, how big is the need? Well, that, let's, let's take a step back for a minute, Glenn, and look at, look at the bigger picture of Asia as an economic block. Sure. Um, and as you know, and as everybody, uh, I think, by now knows, that Asia is the fastest growing part of the world. And mm. Asia, you know, we are in the Asian century, more or less. Um, you know, some might dispute that, but I think the trajectory that we're seeing is fairly clear, is that within the next uh, couple of decades, we are going to have 300 million odd people from Asia entering the middle class. I mean, we've already seen uh, the development in China where we've had, uh, a, a, what was it? I think the number is almost 700 million people mm. have become middle class consumers over the course of the past 20 years or so. And that is just going to, uh, is going to increase. So the question that everybody's asking themselves is, okay, what happens to carbon emissions? What happens to the state of the environment? If those new middle class um, entrants are going to start consuming along the ways that the rest of us consume, yeah. which means what if they all want to drive an SUV and have a backup car? What if they all want to have large screen televisions? What if they all yeah. want to take foreign holidays once, twice a year? You know, the, and we're, the already seeing, we're already seeing that in many cases, right? We look around China, we look around Indonesia. I mean, we, that is already happening, is it not? And the fear is that it, that's only the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, effectively what, what the problem is, is if all those new people and indeed all the rest of us continue to consume and pollute at the scale at which uh, we are doing now, when I say we, I mean you and I, I mean mm. us, uh, we in the developed world, we who have a middle class lifestyle, if we consume and pollute in the way that was established by the industrial revolution technologies, was established by the West, if our per capita carbon output becomes as high as it is in Europe and the US yeah. here in Asia, then the world is seriously in trouble because there's no way we're going to stick to the carbon goals set by the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's the big fear. How do we stop uh, that from happening? And, you know, th that is that is an enormously complex question, which we're certainly not going to solve this morning. But mm -hmm. one way in which we're thinking that we can help is to say, right, one thing that we can do is try and persuade the developing countries in Asia, those countries that are beginning to set up their, their manufacturing processes, their, uh, their industrial processes, uh, their entire economic base. If we can persuade them to choose high level sustainable technologies instead of legacy technologies, the old style polluting technologies, then we're taking one step forward to reducing that per capita carbon footprint. So the idea here is just to say, oh, let's introduce these people. Let's introduce the, the people in Myanmar who are thinking of setting up a business to new ways of doing things mm. that will allow them to do things more efficiently and uh, with less carbon impact. Tamor, one of the challenges I think that has often comes up with this discussion is the fact that the emerging countries say, hey, why should we pay for more expensive new technology when all of you in the industrialized West, in, the, in Europe and North, North America, had your, your years in the sunshine where you could use dirty coal and everything else and pollute on a cheap level, and now you're saying we need to go to more expensive alternatives. Just, to, just this week we saw a new three-year contract between China and Indonesia to supply coal uh, for its mm. power plants and, and what have you. Your program with the, the ADB, are you struggling with that, that dichotomy between uh, old legacy inexpensive things and new technology that might be more expensive? Well, well here's, here's, the, yeah, here's the complexity that I mentioned beginning to creep in. There are, there are two parts to that question. Firstly, mm. the, the moral question, uh, should Asians be asked to carry the load right. that uh, the West did not carry when it had the chance? That's a moral question and it's a very good question. But the, the, the issue here is not necessarily, I, I think, one of is it one or the other. We're not asking that um, Asians should not have the same lifestyle. Mm. We're just saying you can have the same lifestyle, but you have to be a little bit more forward looking in the way you go about getting it. Yeah. New technology is as is more effective 
is more efficient, is more valuable than old technology. Simple as that. I mean, you've seen it all around you in everything that you do. The new stuff is better. Now, the second part of that question is the expense. Now, uh, mm. the, the point that you make here is, should we pay more for it? Well, the expense is also a, a perceptual thing. Expense is, is a matter of either long term or short term. So if you go to your uh, Harvey Norman and you want to buy yourself a new refrigerator, mm. you have the option and it's all laid out for you now. The work has been done. It's all laid out for you. You can buy one which is low footprint. You can buy one which is high footprint. Uh, and the low footprint one, which is the one we would like you to buy, is more expensive than the than the high footprint one. Yeah. So yes, you, you, have a, you have a cost factor in there. But when you're talking about business, when you're talking about large scale technologies employed in industrial facilities, the, the price again is, is also higher, but it's also more efficient. So if you actually, if you're going to sit there and say, the only price that I'm going to accept is the lowest price at point of purchase, mm. then we've got a little bit of a problem. But if you say, actually, if I keep this for 10 years, then this pays for itself and I start actually going into the black after seven years, then you have a different calculus there, right? So it, we're not actually saying that people need to give up anything. You just need to slightly reframe the way you look at these things. Yeah, we're talking with Timur Nabili, the CEO of Tech for Impact. Impact Asia, working on a new uh, platform that was associate, in association with the Asian Development Bank, a uh, content knowledge platform helping to uh, countries with a pipeline of solutions and innovation to help them leapfrog legacy technology. Let's, let's dive a l- little bit deeper into that. I mean, people in this region know the ADB uh, for decades now, uh, sponsoring uh, big projects, uh, infrastructure projects, and other types of projects. What, what, is, the, what is the nature of the relationship with the project you're working on with them? Well, I was uh, hired initially as a consultant to start doing a different kind of communications project, and Tech for Impact grew out of an ongoing association. The ADB has a strategy 2030 document, which is a very comprehensive and in-depth document talking about how the bank perceives uh, the, the development of Asia over the next 15, 20 years, uh, and also how the ADB itself should play a part in that development. Now, the the traditional role of the ADB has been simply as a lender. Uh, It gives money to countries to develop their mostly infrastructural uh, developments Mm. uh, and help them to to lay lay in place the the platform for their economic development. The roads roads and dams and and infrastructure for electricity, things like that, right? All that stuff, all that stuff. Uh, but given the, the, you know, the new state of the planet as we know it, the ADB is beginning to, and, and as I say, look at, look at the, the strategy documents, you can find it online, is talking about there are, there are so many more things that it needs to do to align itself with the SDGs, to align itself uh, with the new paradigms that we're talking about in terms of environmental awareness and global development. Uh, and so it, it, it has a, a whole new approach to how it tries to um, do its business. Uh, I am uh, in association with ADB. I'm not part of the ADB. They've just helped me out with some grant funding yeah. to say, OK, how can we begin to present these arguments in a more consumer friendly way? How can we begin to build communities around the idea that we should all be thinking about this? as a natural part of our daily thinking, not as a, oh, hold on, uh, this is something I might get around to in a different context. This has got to be the default mode in which we operate from now on, is to say to ourselves, what are the consequences of my purchases, of my actions, of mm. my business model uh, on, these, on these issues, on the sustainable development goals? So the ADB is, has, has very, uh, very nicely uh, given me the opportunity to try and set up this whole position of saying, right, let's try and bring this conversation into the mainstream. Let's have a chat on radio about, about what the average consumer can do about this, what the average small and medium-sized enterprise can do to contribute to this process. Yeah. Tamar, it's funny, uh, not funny, but I, I guess maybe slightly ironic, you know, as a journalist yourself for 30 years with CNBC Asia and the BBC and many others, uh, you, you were on the other side of asking these questions for many years. And now that you are trying to communicate these ideas, are you, are you seeing this challenge in a different way? Of course, we've got culture, we've got economics, we've got a, a wide variety of, of countries here that, that don't all think and play on the same level. So from, from your past experience, has this been a, a unique challenge for you to try to think about how to get these ideas across to different, different people and different ways of thinking? Well, you know, as I mentioned for a moment, we've all got to change the way we frame these things yeah. and the way we look at these problems. And yeah. yes, very much so. That, that's applied to me. I mean, as a, as a journalist 
for a long time. My role was to ask tough questions, was to put people on the spot and to look for the flaws in their argument rather than promoting the benefits of a different kind of thinking. So, yes, sure. I've had to completely switch, <laughs> switch the way I approach <laughs> things. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is, as I began to do that and I began to look at the news business and how the coverage of sustainability, how the coverage of environment, how the coverage of, of, of community and impact issues is put forward in the media, you know, you do really begin to suddenly wake up. And, and it, it seems that it's a little bit late, isn't it? You yeah. do begin to wake up to, to the journalistic method and say, actually, journalism tends to focus on the bad news. It's, it's kind of what, what makes news is not dog bites man, it's man bites dog. Sure. Uh, and so what I'm trying to bring to this project is, a, is the, exactly the opposite approach. Is that actually, there's an awful lot of really positive information. There's an awful lot of really helpful information. And there's an awful lot of really valuable tools out there that people are not being made aware of by the mainstream press because the mainstream press is looking for the, is looking for the flaws, is looking for the problems, is looking to hold people to account. I'm doing the opposite. I'm looking to present ideas that have a, a potential positive impact. I'm looking to present the conversation in a context which people can engage with in good faith and without feeling as if they're being bad people or without feeling as if they're a part of the problem and can begin to feel that they can make a difference. Because I think, as you know, one of the biggest problems that we have in getting people into a sustainability mindset is they sit there and go, well, look, what difference does it make if I, one out of seven billion people, uh, you know, choose not to eat more steak this week. They don't think that they can make a difference. But I'm trying to put forward the proposition that actually there's plenty of stuff that as a group we can make a difference in if we just begin to gather around the same ideas, have the same conversations and behave in similar manners around these issues. This, this brings a question to me because as you are trying to generate these ideas and, and have them uh, get some take up around. We have to deal with the reality that in many developing nations across this region, the big enterprises that could potentially change or that need to change, uh, old industry, if you will, are controlled by military, are controlled by a handful of families. Uh, there are legacies here that are very hard to change. And when there's an economic uh, imperative and factor involved in this, uh, I would think that this is going to be a, a real tough change for some uh, individuals or countries to have to deal with when they look at infrastructure changes or project changes. You've put your finger on, on perhaps one of the, the thorniest problems in the whole conundrum, Glenn. You know, the way we do things is stuff that we are accustomed to, the stuff that we are comfortable with. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, the big families or the big companies that you're talking about. Once we have got ourselves into a certain mindset of doing things, once we think things are working for us, we're very loath to change them in any yeah. meaningful way, particularly if that change might, even in theory, lead to some sort of financial loss for us. So it, it's, a, it's a big problem, which is why, you know, Tech for Impact is, is tech for impact. We talked so far about the, the fact that technology can help us in solving some of these carbon related problems. But the second part of, of this project is the impact part. And what we're trying to do is to create impact for real people, is to try and get uh, community level action and activity mm. going on mm. and get people involved at an individual level such that they can contribute to this. And the reason why I think that's important is because, uh, to come to the, to the point of your question, is because companies and governments don't necessarily respond if they don't have a need to respond. Sure. And the more people who begin to demand from them uh, an action, a response, a new way of thinking, the more they will be forced to respond. Yeah. And we're seeing this already, Glenn. I mean, the, you know, the, the really exciting thing is that you don't have to scratch too hard below the, the media surface to find that everywhere, that particularly young people, are beginning to make these demands. They're beginning to say, look, we want to work for a company that has a value system that we agree with. We want to work in a project that makes us feel that we're making a difference. We don't just want to sit behind a desk and be anonymous cogs in a machine. So we're beginning to see those community level uh, activities and uh, agreements coming along. And I think the more that we can encourage that, the more we have a chance of addressing the problem that you put, which is the status quo, which is, you know, the inertia of everybody doing it. 
And yeah. governments eventually do listen to the people. Sometimes in some countries it takes longer than others, but eventually people do begin to sit up and take notice. So the, the louder that we can make the noise, the quicker we can make that. Give us an example, a case study of, of something that you're working on now or have worked on recently uh, where you feel like you're making some, some strides, some success, a particular country, a particular technology. In, in this context, as we talked about before, Making a difference is a long-term project. It's, it's not something we can turn around and say, look, this happened here and that happened there. Mm -hmm. But let, let, me, let me give you a, a basic example of, of things that can work. So the Asian Development Bank did a project on an island in the Philippines called Cobrador last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very simple project. It wasn't something that is um, particularly unique. They, they built a solar-powered electricity generation unit for the island. Mm -hmm. Because it's a small island community, they, they have a, a limited amount of time, a limited amount of resources, and they use diesel generators, which sure. so many of the islands around Indonesia and, and everywhere else do. Yeah. So they said, right, let's, let's, let's put in a, a microgrid. And what they did was they, they developed a, a, a process and, and a solution for this particular island. But out of that solution, they brought forward a, a booklet. Um, a, a document which said, okay, this is what we've learned from the process uh, and this is how we think we can pass on that knowledge. Hmm. Now, my next project is going to be, right, let's, let's take that process uh, of building that microgrid for that island because clearly Cobrador is not the only island in the Philippines. It's not the only island in Asia by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And if we can pass on that knowledge and that expertise and somehow join together the other islands that maybe would find value in that project and pass on the knowledge and the expertise that allows them to do that and bring in some private sector funding and some private sector technology and some private sector materials that can help them do that, then the replication, uh, scaling by replication hmm. uh, would be, uh, I think, one of, the, one of the ways in which we're trying to show some of the uh, countries and, and communities around Asia how they can uh, progress themselves. In the same way, uh, last, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke to Wong Yi Ting, who is one of the senior people at ASTAR here in Singapore. Hmm. Where they, where they do science and research around technology solutions. And we were talking about agricultural technology. And Singapore, as you know, is leading the way with its um, 30 by 30 project of developing urban solutions for growing vegetables, for growing fish even. They're growing fish in tanks in, uh, in, you know, in industrial buildings. Uh, again, if we, can, if we can take these projects and then demonstrate to people in Myanmar, in Mongolia, in Kazakhstan, that one can have... A, a solution within their urban food supply chain that they can manage from within the country and give them the tools to be able to replicate that, then we're beginning to make an impact. And, and these are the kind of long-term goals that I'm hoping uh, to drive with Tech for Impact. Yeah, very interesting. This, this week there was the Singapore Tech Forum uh, introduced by PM Lee, uh, the theme Tech for Good. And I noticed one of the quotes that you had sent me in advance was uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tharman told the audience, quote, countries have to avoid thinking about economic objectives as separate from social objectives, uh, et cetera and talking about sustainability. Uh, these types of conferences are great, but do you, do you feel like there is going to be some, some actual result that's going to come out of it, some, some KPIs that can be measured? Absolutely. I mean, from this particular one and, and from uh, DPM Tarman's comments in particular, you know, as I said a moment ago, what really makes change is when the big guys start to pay attention. Right. Uh, and DPM Tarman's comment uh, to me was was very indicative. And, and, the, uh, and the theme, or at least one of the themes of this conference, again, very indicative of the fact that the Singapore government has tuned in to this imperative. The people uh, and the culture is beginning to go in this direction and are demanding this kind of thinking. Uh, and as, as the DPM said... You know, we, this, this is exactly the kind of thing that, that we're supposed to be doing. And, and this gives me enormous encouragement, Glenn. This is actually exactly everything I'm talking about, is that once we begin to hear governments talking this language, we know that perhaps one of the greatest steps has been taken. Because soon as, as soon as the governments start to build this into the way that not only they talk, but they do their business, then we can really hopefully begin to see some significant changes. Now, this is Singapore, a very small island uh, with a very forward-thinking perspective. I'm not saying this is going to change the dynamics across the world, but yeah. hopefully Singapore can be a, a leader for Asia and be a, a model for some of the other Asian countries to follow. And, and I'm really heartened by the fact that this is happening. Yeah, we've got one of our Facebook fans, Mike Ong, has been uh, uh, texting along the way talking about great projects and using tech for good and, and how dinosaurs are going away, you know, as the Internet and other new technologies come on stream. Uh, people are just going to have to start thinking in new ways. So thanks, Mike, for, uh, for putting those well, look, on there's, Facebook. There's, there's 
I mean, there are so many people now, uh, yeah. Glenn, who are saying these things and talking this language. I mean, they, they don't make it into sort of the mainstream media because, as, <laughs> as I said, the news, dog bites man is not news. But, I mean, under, underneath it, I'm seeing lots of people, lots of communities, lots of countries in, in small ways beginning to form groups uh, of, uh, of activity and, and influence to try and make things happen. Yeah. Uh, Tamor, I'm going to finish up with a question that you would have asked thousands of times in your years as a journalist. So what's next? Uh, Where do you take uh, Tech for Impact Asia? Uh, Where does this discussion, this conversation go in a way that is going to lead to some real results? Well, you know, for, for me right now that the, the question is building the business. Uh, so to, to a certain extent, I've sort of uh, painted myself into a little bit of a corner now because I'm, I'm ha- having, having put forward the, the proposition of this is what we want to do. We want to, to te- take action uh, and to drive activity and engagement. Uh, but unfortunately, I've now had to step aside and, and start building a, a business and a, and a process around it, yeah. which, which takes me away from actually talking about the, the, the process and the philosophy, which is, as, as you know, is what I do. I mean, I, li- I like to have conversations. And I think uh, one of the biggest parts of this is to get people involved in that conversation. So, you know, my principal goal right now is finding ways to get people to join in with the conversation, give them the platform and the capacity and the, and the ability to talk to other people and to, to talk to the world about what they want to see happen and to somehow join together to make a difference. Uh, and how we do that is, is a really key question right now. Tamar Nabili, thank you so much for being with us today, CEO of Tech for Impact Asia. We wish you good luck on seeing some of these changes through and and hopefully uh, helping to create a new uh, reality for many countries across Asia. Appreciate your time today. Great talking to you, Glenn. Thanks.